Let's do it. All right. Welcome, everybody, to the Renegade HPG podcast. This is Travis, and my guest today is Chris Ings. Uh, Chris has been involved with the fan-made Clan Fox uh, for several decades at this point, and we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, what that is, uh, the work that they do with their gaming group, and uh, and just Battletech in general. So, uh, Chris, uh, thanks for hopping on the podcast with me. Thanks you for having me on. Nice to be here. Yeah, it's a pleasure. You know, we got connected by our mutual friend, uh, Robert Ash, who is over at uh, Fortress Miniatures and Games, a uh, sponsor of this channel. And uh, and yeah, and he he kind of pointed and, you know, I looked into kind of what uh, Clan Fox was online. Uh, for those listening, uh, there is a website. It's just uh, clanfox.com. You can hop on over and check it out um, as a little bit of uh, cool swag and merchandise. Looks like you guys got some, uh, you know, custom dice and, and pens and patches and stuff. But, uh, you know, I'm curious kind of a little about, you know, the origin and the backstory about this, because I know Robert said there was there was a lot there and there's some cool stuff, but I'm not super familiar myself other than just kind of glancing to the website. But, uh, you know, maybe, you know, give me a little background on, you know, what's the origin story of this and kind of, you know, how long has it been around? Okay, uh, Clan Fox started in the mid '90s, and was essentially my own personal group for BattleTech. Um, I trace its lineage all the way to one of the original MechForce North America signup sheets back before the status of all the clan names had been really solidified. Okay, uh, I always point to if you look at the of Heroes, that particular uh, source book, mm-hmm. in the last page, there's a MechForce North America signup sheet. And there is, I believe, Clan Punisher, Clan Fox, and a couple of others that didn't actually make the cut afterwards. Okay. And some of the currently existing clans aren't there. Like Clan C Fox isn't there. They seem to have changed it. I guess it was too much canine imagery. But um, anyways, so I latched onto that and decided to just make it my own. And um, that's not the direction that Fossa went. So this is completely fan canon, head canon. Right. But it's just been my own personal group. and. Um, always running games under Clan Fox's banner since then. Awesome. And it looked like you guys, you know, were involved in a lot of almost kind of outreach stuff in terms of getting out and doing a lot of kind of demo games and, uh, you know, and even beyond Battletech, you know, in terms of other gaming, it looked like a, there was a, a paintball team as well, you know, in addition to the gaming and sci-fi yep. and also kind of going to conventions and doing demos. Like what kind of, talk to me a little bit about that kind of demo stuff, because I'm, I'm curious, you know, for, especially as the, the game has really experienced a renaissance, you know, for those, you know, veterans out there that, you know, that enjoy kind of bringing in new players, you know, what's, what's your experience been, you know, kind of on that front and kind of what works and what doesn't. Well, the demonstration stuff all stemmed from uh, the old FOSTA Marauder team, which was the demo team for FOSTA back in the day, the fan pro commandos. Now it's the catalyst demo team. Uh, I got my start there when I just turned 18, because it was the first time I could actually apply and actually be a Marauder on the first time I went, like Gen Con 2000, I think, is the first okay. convention I went to. And going there, um, running Battletech, like, uh, I don't think they even called it boot camp back then, but just running introductory games, um, just running Battletech under the, under the uh, auspices of the Marauders at that time. Uh, there was also, it was back in the old FOSTA time, so it was War, the Maelstrom, um, was just back then before FOSTA closed its doors, and Shadowrun, um, doing Shadowrun, but that was like, uh, before then I'd even done it for like the RPGA, back, um, I'm dating myself, but there have been a variety of games we've played under that, it's like all kinds of science fiction, a bunch of uh, stuff from Palladium, um, Rifts, um, Robotech, because Robotech, Battletech, that's the whole thing, but the giant robots are always favored. There have been other role-playing events. There was a paintball team um, because just we had a logo. The logo looked cool. I thought, well, we're going to play some paintball. Well, I'm going to slap that on a patch, and we can just go and run your Clan Fox. So we did that. Nice. There's a bunch of pictures of that. Um, played paintball in years, but it was fun. Yeah. This was back, this was back in my 20s and 30s. Um, yeah, I remember I only played paintball I think once it was when I was a teen. And so it was very early in the, in the day of paintball. And uh, my outstanding memory is I didn't have a lot of money that time. I went with my friend, you know, and I got like this rental uh, pump action paintball rifle and it jammed like, like half the shots. And I remember like hiding in a forest and kind of having someone like, you know, come, I just like perfectly positioned myself. It's about to snipe this guy, took my shot 
my paintball exploded my gun and then I just got pelted. <laughs> so I think I need to, or something, yeah. yeah, I mean, that was, gosh, that was probably like 95 or something like that. So, you know, yeah. I need to, I need to get back on, on a paintball course with some modern technology and, and enjoy it the way it's meant to me. But, uh, oh yes. Electronically actuated and full automatic. Yeah, definitely. Whole, <laughs> whole new world. <laughs> It's like going to play war games with a, you know, with a, you know, civil war or rifle uh, is what I was doing back then. But, uh, but are you, uh, are you heading to Gen Con this year? And, you know, it's, uh, it's good to know that that's uh, back up and running. Uh, Gen Con this year, um, my own personal opinion on Gen Con this year is it, it's going to be Gen Con, but in a lot of mm. people have set it at a lot of companies are sitting it out. I know Catalyst is going. On um, this particular year, yeah. I've uh, really been limiting my own uh, demo activities locally to the local area, local game shops, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and last year, nobody did anything. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I'm I was looking listening. forward to going next year, though. Yeah, I was listening. Uh, Team Covenant has a wonderful podcast, and they were talking, I think it was in their most recent one about Gen Con and kind of how it's, uh, you know, they were just kind of offering some insights on what it could be you know what it's you know a best case worst case you know and shifting in the best case to kind of being more vendor focused to more just kind of gameplay and community focused which would be great because i think that's what we all need right now it's just to connect with other people in person again but uh yeah who knows you know we'll see it um, kind of became a spectacle it's just it did, became yeah. a giant massive convention with just tons of people crowding downtown and like pageantry involved mm -hmm. and there were still games being played obviously but most yeah. people went for the dealer hall most people went for and you know, a lot of people went for like special events like true dungeon stuff that you did you can't really play that many other places there's a lot right. of there's big production value involved there yeah so that's really the only place you can go and do it because they also go to big like, dragon con and they sometimes go to origins but other than those three True Dungeon doesn't show up a lot of other places because yeah. of just the amount of logistics involved in running that operation. Right. And so I get it. But. Yeah. Well, this might be an opportunity to reset that back to the player focus. I mean, I know like, I mean, almost everything's turned into that, you know, whether it be, you know, San Diego Comic Con, whatnot is more of the vendor commercial side. But have you heard anything about uh, MechCon? You know, the one that Piranha runs? Um, I haven't been to that uh, yet myself. Maybe I had, I, just... I haven't had a chance to make it out to Vancouver for MechCon, but I know yeah. some people who have a good time uh i'm enjoying playing mech warrior 5 right now since it's come out on steam and it's yeah. now available uh, widely except uh, of just an epic and um yeah having a good time so far found a few lads to get together and uh, co-op our way through the inner sphere and that's always a good time definitely yeah i've uh, i've tied into uh my playthrough of mass effect now that legendary edition is back out so that's for my 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 video gaming is yes, i always got to be careful with video games i get sucked in <laughs> hardcore to it so uh yeah you run out of hobby it. time because you're too busy playing video games i know that's right you gotta you gotta be selective it's horrible i want to do all the hobbies but you know <laughs> it's uh either i can produce some renegade hg content or go uh, play mech warrior 5 so you know hopefully people are enjoying the content but uh but yeah, well, the, um, you know, one of the things that was cool on the website that I saw, you know, you guys got a lot of little custom mechs and stuff too. So tell me a little bit about what's come out of there in terms of, you know, these, uh, you know, just kind of the things that you guys been able to make as your, as your play group to kind of flesh out, uh, you know, what Clan Fox is. Uh, yeah. So back in like the early 2000s, there was a uh, internal version of the field manual just mm -hmm. to pattern on the Battletech field manual is done for Clan Fox. Just for personal edification, for group edification. Yeah. Uh, that's currently under a rewrite because it needs to be updated to like Jihad and beyond because that hadn't happened yet when it was first written. Yeah. So in that book, uh, we outlined uh, four unique designs for Clan Fox, again, mirroring the other Battletech source books that have been released so far, as well as writing up some stuff for a couple of uh, unique vehicle designs. Mm -hmm. Vehicle designs haven't been made yet, started with the mechs. But that's been a long, almost 15 year process to try and get those uh, mechs created because it went from initial concept, stat design, shopping, looking for an artist, doing art conceptual design. After that was the steps of um, finding a sculptor, finding a caster, getting the casting done, negotiating all that, and just the waiting involved in all of those steps any type of production like that is always more complex at than first appearance. Yeah. Uh, and 
I am really glad I didn't kickstart any of them because there were significant production delays in several parts of that. And it's yeah. great to not have to, you know, look at anybody and say, yeah, I know I took your money, but it's coming. I promise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that, I mean, there's a, just a disconnect with between the general public and just what goes on behind the scenes of stuff. You see what the, the Kickstarter stuff, fortunately way to, I guess is, uh, you know, within a month or two from now, but, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's hard as a vendor to kind of communicate expectations properly while still maintaining excitement and hard for the customer to just realize just how crazy logistics get behind the scenes. But uh, it's cool I mean, that uh, even now with the current uh, Black Knight, Plan Buster Black that. Knight that was yeah, just yeah. coming, that's just coming out. I mean, it disappeared. I wish uh, Lane and Brent all the best. Yeah. Um, why well, uh, Blaine did a great job with his, he did a little press release this morning that I saw just talking about it and just saying that, you know, they had basically hit the, the reprint button, you know, a couple of weeks ago before it even kind of hit the shelves. And so they'll become, there'll be another stock soon, but. Uh, and apparently a storm crew as well, if I recall. A storm the, crew. Uh, press release correctly. Indeed. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think that's great you know, for great sign for the future of Battletech, especially with Catalyst being willing to kind of license out that stuff and allow, you know, other people to kind of take on that logistical uh, challenge and kind of get that stuff out. But, uh, but yeah, I'm, de- I'm very optimistic about kind of where Battletech is heading, you know, in the future. So, you know, hopefully, hopefully it continues. Hopefully people get excited. Hopefully people are playing in game stores, you know, once they're, they're able to do so. But, uh, but yeah, the, uh, the Black Knight, you know, it looks cool. I'll pick up one when it comes out. It is wonderful. Yeah. seeing the Battletech Renaissance flower into existence. The yeah. Local gaming scene, there is a healthy number of Battletech groups. There is a uh, Michigan Battletech Network as a Facebook group uh, that's available that has a listing of uh, groups both on the west and east side of Michigan. Yeah. So out in Grand Rapids, Jackson, the west side. That's a uh, shout out to Jim Topa, who's the Catalyst Demo Team agent who runs games out there. He's fantastic. Uh, Charles Wilson, a little bit further north. Um, he's also good, and then uh, I typically run stuff uh, here on the eastern side, and um, uh, there's also even non-catalyst aligned people also running games and uh, Solaris matches, and gladiatorial combat, and just regular uh, scenarios and campaigns. It is a great time to be a battle deck player. That's awesome. And what's uh, for people that are in that area? What's the name of that Facebook group? As the Michigan Battletech Network on Facebook. Perfect. And um, just ask, join that group if you're in Michigan or probably southern or northern Ohio or uh, yeah. northeastern Indiana. Get there. I'm sure it's, it's uh, you know, Battletech's not a casual endeavor anyway. So, you know, set out a weekend, go play. You know, it's worth a little extra drive. You can expand that radius of influence there. Yeah, the um, it's been fun. I, I got back into it probably it was what was it about 2018, late 2018, early 2019, where I kind of you know dusted off my box of stuff that had been I've been carrying around from house to house for 20 years or so. And uh, yeah, it's obviously it's been a blast and and kind of being able to kick off Renegade HPG with a little bit of the freedom that that COVID uh, gave me has been has been fun. And uh, yeah, the good good projects along the way, but we we have some fun of. Uh, fun conversations coming up this summer, you know, kind of took it easy in May, but so we got some round tables coming up and some, some old creators again, you know, back in the eighties timeframe, you know, to connect with, but it'll be good, but it's good to see out there. And even uh, looking at the, the Facebook groups and kind of keeping people posted and active. It's been, uh, it's very awesome. It's very awesome and, to see. And the podcasts and all of the media is coming out in mm-hmm. around Battletech is also one of the things I think is fueling the Renaissance. Yeah. Things like your podcast, um, like back during the dark ages when there wasn't a lot of stuff going on. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar, but Fear the Boot, um, Dan Repperger, their main guy there, is also a huge Battletech fan. Talk would, ba- would talk about Battletech, ran Battletech actual plays, um, stuff like that. So that was a, that's a relatively long running RPG podcast now. They're over what, there doing that stuff. What was the name of that again? Your mic cut that up right when. Oh, great. That is Fear the Boot. Okay, fear the boot. Okay, awesome. Uh, yeah, they're out of St. Louis, yeah. and um, they are. They've been going for I think ten plus years now. Yeah, um, just a long time. They run a fear the con every year. Only this year it's online, as it was last year. Mm. And I've run. I've gone out there. I've actually flown out there to play to uh, run Valtech for them. I ran them a blood name tournament. Um, oh, yeah. To uh, we came up with our own gag blood name for them yeah. to. Uh, <laughs> That's awesome. 
to uh, compete over and uh, all the hosts and various people at the convention all gathered together and I officiated a uh, trial of blood right for them under the official rules and that was fun. That's awesome. I definitely need to hop into that. I have such, I have such a remarkably small uh, experience actually playing tabletop. Uh, you know, so much of my own, you know, vector of getting into Battletech is, is through the novels and, and the lore and, uh, and kind of the old video games back in the 90s when I was, you know, a teen. And, uh, and, but, you know, I've picked up with friends and done small tabletop games, but yeah, just the idea of doing like a, a free for all or a blood name tournament or stuff, that sounds like tons of fun that I haven't, you know, had the, the pleasure to get on yet. So you came in through the video games like Mech Warrior 2? I didn't actually. I, uh, my stepbrothers introduced me when I was really young. I was probably like, probably like 11, you know, maybe 12. And, uh, and they would only visit during the summer, you know, and I picked up the game and then I just really enjoyed it, you know, and then I, you know, somewhere along the line, I was picking up like source books, like 3025 source books and the, in the Mech Warrior, original Mech Warrior RPG and, uh, and, and spent most of my time just kind of building my own mechs and building my own mech warriors that I never played with and, uh, and reading all the novels, you know, uh, through my teens, uh, you know, I've told this story a couple of times on the podcast, but, uh, I distinctly remember my eighth grade English teacher coming up to me and being like, Travis, your book report's really good, but I want you to do a different kind of book this time. <laughs> Cause it was like every week, a new battle tech book. Um, and then, uh, and so I was immersed in the universe, uh, when, uh, when Mech Warrior hit, Mech Warrior 2 hit, um, actually I was aware of Mech Warrior 1, but, uh, my, my family didn't have a computer to run it. And then Mech Warrior 2 came and, uh, eventually I was able to get what I needed and lots of time playing Mech Warrior 2, you know, and a little, and Mech Warrior Mercenaries. Um, and then I kind of started to drift out, uh, around Mech Warrior 3, but, but Mech Warrior 2 in the novels, you know, it's a lot of time spent in those things back in the I day. I always love telling the story about how I got into Battletech. I sold it for Graphic 16 for my first Battletech box. I was like 11 years old and yeah. taken ruthless advantage of by some guy at a music shop. <laughs> gave me like 20 bucks for a TurboGrafx 16 back in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't even quite enough, but I had seen it in Nintendo. I had seen it in Nintendo Power that they ran a Battletech. Um, it was around the release of the MechWarrior SNES game. They okay. ran a Battletech contest, and one of the things you could win was the little boxed game that was the old third edition with the miniatures. And I thought that was cool. Mm -hmm. And so I called around and I found a place that had it. And I ended up essentially hawking my TurboGrafx 16 to get Battletech. And <laughs> in reflection, it was probably a good trade, but in the moment, <laughs> I could have probably done better than 20 bucks for that TurboGrafx 16. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, it launched a lifelong hobby and love. So it's it's funny, kind of the little the little intro, little ways we connect with the things when we look back at it. But uh, yeah, I was uh, I had the uh, the I was in second edition. You know, I have the, still have my second edition box. You know, sitting around here. Um, but uh, but yeah, it was good stuff. Playing with the old little cardboard standees. Mm -hmm. I didn't even actually. I didn't even actually. Well, I didn't even play with a miniature on the table until like. Two years ago was the first time I'd actually, you know, before that it was cardboard standy or nothing. So what was the first That's miniature like, you ever bought for Battletech? Centurion or Battlemaster. Sure. It was one of those two. Centurion, I had a Battlemaster. Yeah. My first one was a blue blister Battlemaster was the first yeah. metal miniature that I had because I had yeah. the box set minis. But the first one I bought. Yeah. That's such a cool stance. And the weight on that mech is good. I like the weight of the old metal mechs, but, uh, you know, some of the, some of the old metal ones are kind of questionable, but the Battlemaster... It holds up and yeah the centurion was kind of a uh, favorite line art by loose back in the day and probably my favorite mech probably because i i really enjoyed my stackpole's books back then and you know obviously mm -hmm. with yin wang um and then the valkyrie you know those those were the three three mechs that i really uh, enjoyed uh, the look of and i have those i still have those three miniatures they're they're behind me you somewhere. can totally tell i'm a clan player because my first books were way of the clans you know that way of the that clans might be uh, my first my first blood book name and falcon yeah. guard yeah and so i was introduced to the clan mechs almost first mm -hmm. almost i mean it, i had the they had the box set mechs but as far as the novels those are the first ones because um it was a 24-hour supermarket meyer for those of them who, for, the, for anybody who knows it up in mm -hmm. this area in michigan it was a 24-hour supermarket that had a book section had the old rock paperbacks mm -hmm. and so some battle tech novels would pop up in there and 
my mother would go shopping. I would sit in the little cafe area in the front because she was going shopping and that was boring. And I was 12 or 13 and I would just read. It was between reading Battletech novels and the far side. Nice. Had the far side collection <laughs> yeah. of Barry Larson back in the yeah. day. And between those, I would just take those. I would get like a $1 pop with free refills from the overnight counter. And she could like shop for two hours just wandering the store. And I'd be like, oh, it was time to go already. Yeah. Best time. I think um, the the cover art for Way of the Plants, I think, is possibly the best cover art, you know, for, for getting non-Battletech people into Battletech. It's just a really cool cover art to be like. And that's the know. cover with the guy hiding from the dire wolf. Like he's exactly. hiding in the ruins with that dire wolf stalking by. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah. It's just really like if you look, I mean, you look at the old, you know, you know, wolves on the border, you know, the old warrior trilogy, you know, um, cover arts, you know, it's, it's, you know, quality, there's some quality art there, but in terms of like capturing the imagination, you know, there have been some great covers since Way of the Clans, but I think as far as looking at those early ones, I think that stands out. Well, and, and the 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 um, the Great Death Legion has some good that locust, you know, uh, cover. Decision art on Thunder one. Rift. I was going to bring that up because that yeah. is fed. That is good cover art. When mm -hmm. you're talking about '80s and '90s Battletech art. It is definitely hit and miss. Oh, totally. So, yes. <laughs> so once once the cartoon came out and you had those, you know, those kind of uh um oh God, I forgot who the artist was that did a lot of the, kind of the, the blocky stuff. But uh but yeah, once they started plastering that number one animated series and then had the kind of you know low budget art on front, there was definitely a turn. But uh but no, the way the way of clans was was a highlight. Um, you know, for they're good quite, paintings they're and, good uh, paintings. yeah, you mentioned, you mentioned the day of heroes source book. Um, you know, the, that cover art is great. That's the Boris Vallejo. I mean, Boris is an, an exceptional mm -hmm. fantasy artist anyway, but that's a, that's a very good, one of my favorite cover arts as well. But, uh, yeah, I, uh, we had Walden books, you know, was where I would always, you know, get my Battletech books, you know, the Walden books back in the day, which I think is faded into memory. At least it has up in Massachusetts where I'm at, but, uh, yeah, same thing. Lots of times I would always love getting into go into the bookstore and I would see if there was a new Battletech book out because, uh, you know, for those youngins out there, we didn't you didn't know if a new Battletech book was coming out until you went to the store and you saw something new on the, the shelf that you hadn't seen before. But uh, if yeah. you were really clever and your parents wouldn't take you or whatnot, all and you could ask. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> if you thought to do it, you're hoping to get that trip out there so you could come and see for yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good times back then. But uh, yeah, the um, so what um, you know the 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 swag that you guys got on your website is cool. The between the Dyson patch and the uh, and the enamel, I like those those enamel pens, especially especially with the new Kickstarter ones that came out. What uh, you know, I need to get some of those for Rangate HPG. Where do where do you uh, like? How do you get those? Where do you contact to get all that kind of uh, that? Well, there are device? a variety of Chinese companies you can contact to get a lot of that stuff done. A lot of them yeah. have like. Uh, Western friendly interfaces that you can use to make the orders or intermediaries. Um, those were made through wizard pins, mm -hmm. which you will sometimes see uh, advertised here and there. I, f I do not remember where I saw the advertisement for them, but I was like, eh, swag's probably cool. And yeah. I like the pill pin. So, um, yeah, they turned out nice. Um, I also actually have uh, upgraded dice as well beyond the dice that are available on the site. I mm -hmm. uh, had a limited run done of the uh, aluminum pucks. Uh, okay. Oh, sweet. The yeah. catalyst did. I've seen those. Uh, those I've are available. Those, on on, those are, yeah. Yeah. yeah that's on Instagram. Um, those, those are not for sale, unfortunately. Gotcha. Those are a limited run um, for friends and family of the clan. But um, if you ever see them in the wild. You well, know if you get a, a, if you get a ton OG. of. Yeah, if you get a ton of friend requests on Facebook, all of a sudden you'll know why. <laughs> <laughs> um, what are what kind of like uh, order quantities? You know, for those out there, you know, including myself, like looking for that, like when you're when you're ordering those, like what do you, you know, what do you have to invest as kind of the minimum to get a good run? Uh, for the pins? Yeah, for any of it. Uh, yeah. So most places you go want like a minimum order quantity between fifty and hundred. Okay, um, that's not bad. Yeah. Yeah, it, it depends completely on the individual uh, seller, the manufacturer, and mm -hmm. what their policies are. Uh, the one that I found was you could do a minimum run of 50. Okay. Um, and, of course, economy of scale, the per unit price gets better the more you buy. Definitely. Definitely. 
Well, definitely cool. I uh, I had put out a, a little thing for on the, the Renegade HPG social media about shirts and seeing what people like for that. So I still need to kind of get contact. It's oh, hard yeah. to find. Speaking of shirts, I mean, we got that too. I mean, this is actually, uh, I am wearing a shirt in uh, um, honor of the completion of the mech project. Uh, okay. There's a little bitty picture of one of the mechs here and a, mm -hmm. a much bigger logo on the back. Um, that's actually on the Clown Fox Facebook uh, page, as you can see um, that particular design. Uh, the Balgare design team. Yeah. Um, that was uh, a version of that shirt is going to be made available eventually. Uh, there was a, a run done with uh, the actual logo on the sleeve. Nice. Uh, which were given to everybody who participated, uh, the sculptor, uh, mm -hmm. the artist, um, everybody who was involved with that got one of these shirts. Uh, there will be another version of it without the uh, arm uh, logo. Right. Um, that's that will be made uh, publicly available later. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, I remember clan clanfox.com. You know, swing on over there for some cool stuff, guys. But um, but yeah, and I got this. I got uh, you know, the yep. my Urbex from Eldon. You know, he's uh you know, I'm looking forward to the next uh, Marauder Marauder shirts that come out. <sighs> I tried, tonight. I tried to get a commission from him. Yeah, but he is way too busy now. He is, yeah. <laughs> uh, Texas money is too good. Yep, I hear you. Yeah, I, um, you know, I, I tried to get a little bit before, uh, if see if he could help out with the Renegade HP way back before I had any Patreon income, and uh, and uh, he was he was able to start something for me. He was going to help out, and then all of a sudden the work, the real pain work came in. But uh, but no, maybe I can stag him now that there's actual like Patreon money coming in. Get something cool. I, One of I'm the other a... neat things about the BattleTech Renaissance mm -hmm. is you're getting more people coming in. You're getting more artists saying, "Hey, I can draw that." Definitely. And the thing that we need is good technical artists because whenever mm -hmm. you're talking about drawing mechs it is much different than drawing a uh, organic or human form and as long as you know how to draw straight lines which is unfortunately one of the worst things to try and draw <laughs> um but as long as you can draw straight lines you have a great future in drawing giant robots yeah well you're preaching to choir i mean that's uh you know i set up the gallery 3025 to kind of you know hunt down and find artists uh, ideally outside of battletech or artists that have done a little bit in battletech but aren't quite mainstream and uh, kind of get the, get some work out of them and trying to get some some visibility in. And so where uh, I pulled in uh, Jaden Morris, um, who uh, you know did some did a couple pieces of a, a pair of bushwhackers and then some Lobos, you know that you can find online, but not that much. But both very high quality uh, pieces. And he's done a lot of the paint schemes, uh, which turned out to be my favorite. Some of my favorite paint schemes on uh, on uh, Unit Color Compendium. And, uh, and so really talented by that, you know, has very little stuff in there. And so he's, we're working with him right now to do a, uh, you know, an archer, uh, basically getting some field repairs, you know, after, a, after a major battle, um, as a, as an artwork. And yeah, you know, the, we've, we've had great response from the community and supporting the gallery there, you know, it's basically just trying to get as many people as it can ship in two bucks and then use that money to basically give, bring in artists, you know, the idea is to try and find some, maybe some concept artists, some people kind of working outside of Battletech, but in the sci-fi or mecha genre and, uh, and see what they can do with Battletech, you know, and kind of, uh, so yeah, you're preaching the choir, you know, I'm trying to get more in there and certainly with, uh, with, uh, Bruins, you know, we got some Macquarie Bulldogs, you know, published, you know, over the finish line or school. I'm actually doing it. I'm commissioning a piece with uh, Bruins now for myself, which I'll share on the Renegade HG Patreon. But, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's fun. You know, it's, uh, that visual media, man, that the artists do a great thing for battle tech. So, you know, it's been, it's been cool to kind of, you know, talk to those people and, and see more coming out of them. You know, now it's becoming more popular. We still have design work to do too. There's uh, some vehicles to design. So I need to yeah. find a vehicle designer. Fortunately, uh, some of the best are booked up. Yeah. Like well, I, saw, uh, I saw Dale Dale Ida on uh, Twitter yesterday. He was uh, he was uh, fishing for some work. You know, basically saying if you got money, I got I got time to make you stuff. So he he does uh, he does some good uh, good modeling. Um, so he might be a good Ooh. one to reach out to. You know, I'll have to write that down. Remember yeah. that for later. You could yeah. uh, if you could send me a reminder after this is done. Definitely, definitely, I'll do that. Yeah, I, I reached out to Dale too about hopping onto a, a roundtable, uh, you know, as we got coming up. So, uh, so we'll have him on the podcast as well. But uh, yeah, a lot of fun stuff there. But cool. What's well, um, you know, in your group there, you know, how many? You said it was pretty vibrant. How many people do you got playing? Um, it, it depends on whoever shows up in any given. Uh, we've had as many as you know ten players show up. And sometimes it's just three people show up. It's yeah. uh, it depends on what's going on, what we're doing. We've run um, 
you know, multi-part campaign games we've run, uh, individual scenarios. Some of it has to do with Clan Fox. Some of it doesn't. Mm-hmm. Um, it's uh, just this Clan Fox is my pet project uh, as far as the, the Battletech entity goes, which is yeah. kind of different from the gaming organization because that's just like playing games. So, uh, yeah, all sorts of people. It started with just the core of like my family and a few close friends. Mm-hmm. And then it's uh, and any given weekend, it's whoever shows up at the table can be part of the clan. Awesome. Well, what's uh, what are some kind of favorite uh, campaigns that you run? You know, what kind of storylines or uh, you know maybe battles? You know, any battle stories that have really kind of resonated with you as you know top experiences? Let's see, give us your war stories, Chris. Oh boy, there <laughs> there are a few. Let me think about them. Um, there have been um several mercenary campaigns, uh, because those are the easiest to run mm. and the most fun. You get the most eclectic mix of units and whatnot when you go traipsing across. The inner sphere as mercenaries. Uh, everybody picks up a mercenary handbook at some point, one of the mercenary manual, and starts reading through it and making their own unit and coming up with all that kind of stuff and their own dropship and handling logistics and getting yeah. either getting lost in the minutia of figuring out every last round of SRM ammo. Um, so we've done like runs. I like the free Rassel Hog Republic. Mm. Um, and they didn't like mercenaries too much. So playing along the Steiner Rassel Hag border um of uh you know harassing back and forth and local systems who are just busy enough um because most of them are worried about the cretans um that just let them go and didn't like it too much so uh having to play both sides against the middle Mm -hmm. that was a a pretty fun campaign because uh um you're always worried about finding the steiner scout squad um with your uh, russell hog heavies and That's never a good time for anybody, um, except the signers. Mm-hmm. So um, those have been some fun ones. <sighs> uh, playing with artillery. Um, quite often, especially in campaign games, I will be the game master. So I'm just running op four. And so I will. Uh, I can sometimes abstract. The artillery rules a little bit from rules as written basically to make them play a little better and make them just uh, a little easier to get your head around rather than dealing with the complex scatter and whatnot tell us what are some of your kind of uh you know insider tips there you know how to make artillery a little bit more easy and fun um i took a lot of stuff from just could be to be play miniatures rules so mm-hmm. typically it's not going on to taking place on a hex map okay so in order to handle that handling stuff like scatter i actually took a page from the old war the maelstrom uh game and so when you're dealing with scatter after you've made your strike roll and it misses to scatter you just roll a d10 uh the d10's arrowhead top serves as the direction of scatter and the value on the d10 is the distance of scatter so you can scatter up to 10 inches or like you say you just missed by one it scatters half that distance so up to five inches away from the target point and that's just a really quick and easy way of not having to not having to put a hex ba- a hex base down and figure out which hex facing and then go that many inches out. It's just and it's more granular because mm-hmm. that uh, arrowhead can face just about any direction. Yeah, when it gets dropped on the table. I always thought that was an interesting uh, scatter mechanic and pretty useful. Yeah, I uh, I had a lot of fun, you know, playing on uh, on miniature rules as opposed to the hex, just because of that flexibility. Even even just with something as simple as turning, you know, where you weren't fixated on on turning kind of just a hex. If you wanted to turn half a hex, you know, you could turn half a hex. You know, yes, and like the the inch lateral move when you're taking a move, having mm-hmm. that wiggle room is also extremely useful. Yeah, because uh, you just want to be able to inch over a little bit, but not have to pay for it. You get that inch of uh, drift you can yeah. make without there being a problem with it yeah it was good it was uh so i am excited uh to kind of get some games in on a lot of the new hex max that catalyst has come out they have some pretty cool stuff i didn't go all the neoprene stuff yeah the neoprene stuff i didn't go too crazy on hex maps uh because i went a little crazy on the miniatures you know but uh but hopefully i went in way (laughs) well i think that's true of everybody but uh But yeah, I, I ended up going in double what my original was, but uh, but a lot of miniatures came out of it. So and well, I was... all I say is my wife raised her eyebrows and Fair. was like, "Well, bills are paid, roof is replaced, got the money." Yeah, do it. 
<laughs> well, I, I, I endeavor to keep a, a zero, um, a zero net uh, expense sheet for my, my hobby. So when stuff comes in, it has to go out. Fortunately, there's, there's some things that are, you know, the collectible market has gone crazy the last year and a half. And so it's easy to kind of <laughs> let go of old stuff, you know, for enough money to pay for the new stuff. But uh, that's a yeah. lesson I need to learn. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it ends. I've definitely got more things sitting in this room than I need to. This is this kind of my the, the master bedroom in the house we use as as my office and hobby room. So a lot of space. I never really did get the whole like using your mat, your bedroom as your biggest room. I was like, oh, you're just sleeping in there. You know, you're doing other stuff in other rooms. But uh, that's a good point. Although yeah. I have a relatively spacious basement office, which you can probably tell by the decor behind me. In the lighting. Yeah. Uh, my that hobby desk good. is behind me. Yep. Same, yeah. I'm hiding the the multitude of miniatures on my mm -hmm. desk back there. You know, lots primed, very few with a base coat, and maybe one or two that are uh, that are actually painted. But uh, we all have aspirations, you know, to paint. But uh, well, you know, miniatures painters can never die until they've painted their last miniature, which makes all of us immortal. immortal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Well, I was uh, I was very fortunate. I connected with uh, uh, one and five one had um, on um, on Twitter uh, when he posted this. Uh, it's really amazing uh, Timberwolf that he had painted. That was a uh, homage to the um, to the uh, Timberwolf loadout uh, poster from the uh, Kickstarter yep. uh, by Marco. And uh, and yeah, I reached out to him. I'd never gotten a commission before, and I, I reached out to him. And uh, and he actually offered to paint a lance, you know, uh, as thank you for what I was doing to Renegade HPG. And then for the other stuff we just traded, you know, I sent him a bunch of extra product, you know, and kind of in exchange for painting some other stuff. And so I'm, uh, you know, he's been posting a lot of that on his Twitter, and you know, this very talented painter. So it'll be cool to kind of get those back and get them on the table. I've been but, painting uh, mix for like 20 some odd years and i mm -hmm. still look at some people who come up into the hobby and do it yeah how do you do that i can't do that yet so like when i had the miniatures done like i have some that i've painted for myself because of course i do of course i painted mm -hmm. myself yeah but i also for you know showing them off and showing other people and getting good promotional stills to say hey this is what they look like yeah, yeah i also uh um, went out and had uh commissions done uh zach at zombie brush studios streams on twitch is i give him a shout out as well because big guy and he did up uh, all four of the current clan fox max and those are the actual pictures we go to the website and actually see the pictures of the painted miniatures those are his awesome. uh, his work what are those what are those tags again give him a little extra attention for the shout out if people are interested whether uh, that is uh zombie brush studios okay. on twitch and um he streams most days awesome yeah i've been um you know, I follow Squidmar has a great uh, email, has a, a great uh, YouTube channel there with Squidmar. And uh, and I like his uh, where he uh, where he goes to Fiverr and kind of uh, commissions a lot of people to do paint. I, I, I want to do that for um, uh, for Renegade HPG uh, this fall. I think I think there's probably like a four month setup for getting those like sent out and painted to come back to produce the video. So I, I want to hop on that. But I thought that'd be a cool thing to do for Battletech as well is kind of, you know, pick uh you know, pick five or 10, you know, people on Fiverr, you know, that do miniature painting and just send them some mechs and, uh, and see what they come back with. I think that'd be a fun video, um, to make out there. And even I've been not even going through Fiverr, but just kind of finding people in the Battletech community and send them out a way to kind of drive some attention to them so they get some commissions. Before I got really That's big it. on Fiverr, I recall there was, I have done other commissions in the past, mm -hmm. somebody who painted up an entire company of Capellans for me nice. because I need more op for to shoot at. Everyone shoots a capellans. Creating <laughs> capellans, so it's, I need somebody to do this for. Me. Yeah, awesome. I can't remember what that service was though. I think it a Fiverr has risen up, and people are just doing it on Fiverr. Yeah, yeah. The favorite mech I painted is a Leo mech. Uh, it's a Red Lancers. Um, really cool looking paint scheme, and also a very beginner friendly paint scheme because it's all you know straight lines. You know, mm. there's not not too much shading and stuff needed, so it came out really good. It required a novice level of paint skill and a lot of patience, but yeah, that was fun. But yeah, there should, uh, yeah, there's a lot of talent. And as you said, with the Renaissance and more people coming in, we're just going to get more artists, more creators, you know, more painters in there because you know, there's, yes. I mean, Warhammer definitely War. has some, some painting <laughs> talents up on that, uh, up on the rest of us. You know, they have a big community too, but uh, yeah, they're out there. We can all learn from each other. One of the, uh, I did ask uh, um, Oliver, you know, the, uh, the, 
a one in five one. I really got to memorize what it is. I think it's one in five one on on Twitter. Um, who actually just got uh, selected as a camo specs painter. So shout out to him for that. Um, but uh, right. the I had him do a version of that that Marco Timberwolf for me that mm-hmm. beta that Clan Wolf Beta Galaxy, and he recorded um, the the entire painting process that I not have the files, and now I just got to edit to be like a painting tutorial that I'll post up on on uh, Renegade HPG. But, uh, but yeah, you know, I know, uh, I know there's some other good painting tutorials out there too, but it's, uh, some of them are a little bit too edited. You know, I'm like, uh, you know, I was like, I can't, you did your video is only 20 minutes long. I'm guessing that there's more to it. <laughs> um, so this one will actually be like the entire paint process. You know, people can fast forward or skip through if they want, but it'll be there if they want it. You know, so for me as a novice painter that doesn't know what he's doing, I was like, this is what I would need. You know, give me a step by step. Let me know exactly what I'm going to do, what brush I to use, what what color paint to use. That's actually but, something that I'm uh, thinking of doing on uh, either the site or on the Facebook, is adding mm-hmm. some of my own painting tutorials because I do uh, I do a lot of camouflage, mm-hmm. and camouflage can be a pain in the butt, and uh, to make it look right, mm-hmm. uh, especially at scale. And I've gotten to the point where I'm good at it on instagram yeah. i have a few pictures of those and uh, adding videos of that and like explaining the, the theory behind it yeah. breaking up outline color selection all that kind of stuff well as a novice painter i'll tell you like it's needed you know and there are painters out there listening um you know detailed tutorials is like the, the problem is that when you do the tutorials like the experts kind of they they undervalue the the things that are obvious to them at the time. And I mean, I'm a, essentially a teacher by trade, you know, and an athletics coach. And so I understand that, you know, you got to be really careful that the things that are automatic for you, that you don't assume are automatic for the people that you're teaching. And a lot of the, a lot of the painting stuff out there is just edited down to kind of short stuff and kind of like some of the little things are, are, are cut out, you know, and I'm like, uh, you know, be as, you know, with those tutorials, be as detailed as possible. People always, and if you put the timestamps on it, people can skip forward if they want to. It was like, oh, I, you know, I know how to prime this, you know, you know, I'll move on. But, you know, when I first started, I was like, how do I prime? You know, it was like, what's the best thing to use for primer? Like, I didn't know, like, you know, it, you should avoid certain temperatures or humidity levels and stuff like that, you know, things that people take for granted. And so if people are doing tutorials, man, get into the weeds with it. It'll really help the, the, the people who are coming up with no clue like myself. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we need more of them out there. So this is my thumbs up for you getting some, some painting tutorials. Yeah. Um, Cause back in the day, if you don't, if you don't prime correctly, it gets all grainy and mm-hmm. that's really a good time for anybody. Yeah. It's no fun. All right. So tell me, you, you mentioned a little bit before about the process of creating those mechs. You know, I know when we were talking about, you know, what, uh, you know, the clan buster and stuff, but uh, you have a lot of mechs on your website too, as well. And you kind of mentioned how long the process was. So you must've put a lot of work in because I think there's what half dozen or so. Uh, mechs there are four. On the site? four. There's okay. one on one in each weight class. Uh, the lightest, I mean, it all has a Fox theme because, well, and Fox obviously, but yeah. Um, the lightest one is the shadow Fox, 35 tons. Um, then we have the Red Hunter at 55 tons. There's a uh, Rabbit Fox at 70 tons and the Balgare at 90. Nice. And was there, do I remember seeing a quad there? I know there's a quad on your shirt. That's the Balgare. Okay. That is the, uh, that is the assault of the 90 ton. Um, there's a big turret on top of it. Um, put some antenna on it. Looks like a, a main battle tank got foil legs. Nice. I like it. And those, and if people, uh, those can, they can check that on your website too. Is that on Fortress Miniatures and Games as well? That is also available on Fortress. Um, awesome. Right now they have uh, the entire line. Perfect. Yeah. So people head on to Fortress Miniatures and Games.com and, uh, you know, pretty much anything you need for Battletech, you know, in production or out of production. But, uh, but yeah, so you got the Clan Fox Mechs there and you can get like the patch and the pen and the, uh, um, Yep, those That's are all right. available there as well. Uh, the Excellent. patches, pins are available either through our site directly or from Fortress. Very cool. And um, the uh, files for Battletech, and they are sold as mecha miniatures Okay. Um, because I don't want to step on anybody's toes. Yeah. But um, the there will be rules and uh, stats for other uh, six millimeter miniatures games mm-hmm. uh, because those are convertible to just about anybody's stuff. Uh, Hard War that uh, the guys at Strato do. Uh, right, they can be used in CAV or any other science fiction six millimeter scale game. Very cool. And you got record sheets out there that people can pick up with them. Those are available on the site right now for Battletech currently, and more games as the conversions are done. 
Gotcha. And what uh, what era are those mechs from? Uh, those mechs, in as far as the fictional canon universe goes, is um, th- they start in the thirty fifties and okay. end in the thirty sixties. So the okay. Algar, which is the assault and the last design that gets made, uh, is thirty sixty two production. Gotcha. Are those all Omni mechs or are they battle mechs? They are all Omni mechs. Um, nice. Built this clan and. Again, in the fictional universe, uh, Clan Fox is hiding out all the way around the Davian side of space, uh, having to escape the clans because uh, the way they're written in, or the way I dovetail them into the existing canon before I veer off into my fan stuff, was uh, back uh, at the time of the Dracoon Compromise around the year 3000, mm-hmm. when um, uh, Clan Coyote uh, had to deal with its... Um, scandal but it was uh they had a, a significant scandal they became uh much lessened which is why they weren't a big player after that because they'd been in the golden century previously clan coyote the inventors of the omni were one of the big uh clans to deal with in the big one of the bigger warden clans uh so instead of them just losing essentially half of their strength because they excised it they well it just became clan fox and ended up um retreating to a abandoned star league outpost uh in the periphery, deep periphery of the Davian side sphere. So I love imagining what's going on in the periphery. Just people that have just kind of like snuck away and kind of made their own little home without people knowing. You know, that's uh that's where the explore side of my imagination goes there. You know, what's out there. But uh, I think that'd be a cool novel. I know you know everyone and their mother got canon characters, but uh, I bought mine before I realized there would be another eight thousand people doing it. <laughs> so, uh, you see, I you got know. canon characters in my thing, but I didn't use them. Yeah, I didn't use them because, like, after I've spent so much time building my own faction and building my own head cannon, mm-hmm. I just can't imagine myself fitting in anywhere else. Fair. Yeah, yeah. There's the kind of glitched on mine, and so um, it didn't quite it like accepted the survey before i'd finished the survey and so uh so i need to i need to follow up with them i try to follow up with them you know early in the 2019 early 2020 time frame uh but uh the the customer service the response time wasn't that great back then but uh but yeah because i had gotten the one with the uh that has a picture with it and um and i had like basically just logged in and put my name and put like a quote and then i've been like oh this is i don't have time for this i'll do it later and then they just accepted that, you know, even though I didn't click on the send. So I need to go back. Hopefully the fact that it doesn't actually have a picture and, uh, and uh, I paid for a picture that they won't, uh, they won't just grab it before it's ready. But well, it's going to be ongoing for a while yet still, because yeah. technically we got two. And when my wife found out I wasn't using them, it's like, well, I want to use them. Yeah. Like, awesome. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay. You can have a Jade Falcon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a love hate relationship there. Yeah. <laughs> Funny. Yeah, yeah. Aiden, she is an Aiden Pride fanboy or fangirl, Fair. I guess. So, Fair. yeah, Aiden, Aiden's a funny one because it's uh, you know, it's he's like the the first big clan character, but he's as the whole point of is he's not clan. <laughs> he's a not clan can clan guy. You know, our anti clan clan guy. But uh, but no, yeah, I I enjoyed Aiden. Um, you know, as a as a rebel type character myself but uh but yeah i know a lot of people just think he's a little stale your your wife's favorite uh, character was aiden kind of what's what's your favorite novel what's your favorite character and story in the battletech universe oh wow that's actually a great question my favorite story in the battletech universe the ones i have read so far how um, far have you read i read everything up to the dark age Okay. I read the first few in the Dark Age, mm. and then I kind of fell off the wagon because I was, I won't say grognard because I didn't hate it. I actually played a little bit of click tech to make sure I didn't like it. Mm. I even went and placed at nationals, so I made sure I had played it, and I played <laughs> it to a level where it was like, okay, I know yeah. what I'm doing. Yeah, but, you, gave, you gave it a fair shot. Yeah, uh, yeah. so placed 21st that year at nationals so okay. not too shabby but anyways um after that i was like eh, eh, eh. 
But I did pick back up again now that they are dovetailing that back into the main Battletech storyline, essentially, and then yeah. making that a continuity. So I did read uh, Blaine's most recent. I read Hour of the Wolf. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm roaming back to read a few of the previous ones before then. There's a setup uh, to get the uh, the drive into the Ilkhan era. Yeah. But I'm probably going to have to go with a very pedestrian pick and go with some of the uh, stack pull novels like... Um, Like the main Warriors of Kerensky trilogy is always good, mm-hmm. with also special nods to a few things like uh, Bread for War. Um, I am Jade Falcon in some places. Mm. The jump jet to the face death for Natasha Kerensky is a head scratcher. <laughs> um but sure i guess i mean something's got to get you eventually right i uh somebody finally helped me find contact information for bob thurston and i reached out but i didn't hear anything uh back from him so maybe i'll try again he's one of the few uh, of those original authors that i haven't talked to but it was funny listening to stackpole talk about the death of kerensky how he was like when it came up he was like not touching it hands off (laughs) someone else Someone else can do it. <laughs> and, Speaking uh, of which, there is this other thing. I, 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 I can definitely tell you which Battletech novel I thought was the worst. Okay, and it is not Far Country. They can stop with that whole business about you know. I don't. I th- I, go. It was goofy, but I didn't think it was that bad. Yeah. Have you? Have you? Uh, jo- I don't know if you connected with uh, George Ledoux on uh, on. Um, on youtube but he has a video there where he does a narration for far country um i'll find it i'll put it i'm not going to spoil it it's amazing i'm going to put it down in the uh, <laughs> the comments below and so if people want to catch that or not in the comments in the description if you want to catch that george Lido narrating far country it's amazing um but yeah far not that bad i know we talked to blaine i know what blaine's you know least favorite uh battle tech novel is but uh, Mine? What's, what's yours it's with absolutely no disrespect to the author mm-hmm but Grisman's The Dying Time. Okay. The way they took out the Grey Death Legion mm. in that fashion. I yeah. understand them thinking that, you know, we need to change. They can't win all the time. They've got to go eventually. But Keith wasn't allowed to do it. Mm. Probably didn't even want to do it. But you should be able, I believe it was, a, it was a, a line in one of his other novels. You need to be able to shoot your own dog. And they brought Griezmann, Griezmann, I'm sorry, I'm just pronouncing it. I believe it's Thomas Griezmann. Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah. um, No disrespect to him. I have read other novels of his in Battletech that were good. In this particular novel, it felt to me like he was brought in as a paid hitman. Hmm. Well, I have a little backstory of that because I've I've connected with Bill Keith and uh and we were close to getting him on the podcast and then i actually dropped the ball because i wanted to reread his novels because i hadn't read them in 20 years uh before i got him on and then i just like i haven't read anything since so hopefully he's you know he'll accept my apology when i come back and be like i finally read reread the stuff so i can actually talk with fresh memory (laughs) but uh but yeah there's there's a little background in that uh you know you know suffice to say uh bill wasn't too happy with how the great f legion went out either but um but yeah, it's, it made uh, me sad. It was the it was, only book I've ever destroyed. Yeah, really. Well, it was interesting because I had, I had talked to whenever I talk to an author, I talk about, you know, I ask that question of kind of what it's like to kind of write other people's characters and have other people write your characters. And most of the answers so far have been kind of diplomatic, you know, but I just feel like if I was in there and I invested so much time in kind of building character, the great death legion, for instance, you know, and Grayson, um, that yeah you'd want to be consulted you know but it is it does seem to be so freelance and so partitioned between the writing um and uh and it kind of goes through the steering the story you know drivers which are not the authors you know so but yeah i would uh that'd be tough i mean you look in a universe like star wars and it's so vast and there's so many people you know contributing to it and so you just like you can't have the same person writing the character all the time Mm -hmm. you know and uh yeah, it's a that's a weird thing to think about, you know, as, as someone who has a is creative myself of like, I feel like I would just be too proprietary with, you know, my characters, you know, if I was writing, I was like shared no. universes in particular, it's a thorny problem. Yeah, you have 
both the creative impulse for wanting to keep the control because of the creative process and it never really stops the creative process once it starts keeps on going and you keep on thinking about it you keep on revisiting it even if you've put it down for years you'll come back to it with new perspective and mm -hmm. new understanding and new ideas and approach it in a different manner yeah. and you're like well we could do this with it and then this would happen and then you could do this other thing and with shared universes it's not it's harder to keep it. That impulse is still there, mm -hmm. but there are times when it's destructive or counterproductive to try and indulge it as much yeah. as you might like to, because yeah. as when a bunch of people can feel like they have ownership of it, even if they really don't, they feel like they do. Mm -hmm. And that is where you get the personal investment. And that's where you get, well, the people who spend way too much money on it yeah. and way too much time and love everybody. <laughs> that's what we need we got a passionate community you guys listening are great so uh yeah it'll be it'll be fun to see kind of where things go in these next few years more stuff more minis great. more games more versions um, looking forward to it this next month i get to open gigantic boxes of stuff mm -hmm. catalyst because i went for wave two shipping so everything oh you got all your wave one wow so everything Amazing. wave one and wave two and i'm probably I don't know. I might even make a video for it or something. Just clear Good. off an entire the entire gaming table and just have a Loki or Thor Ragnarok moment. Behold <laughs> my stuff. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, as, uh, people love unboxing videos, man. I just uh, did it casually, uh, you know, uh, when I got my way one stuff and that video exploded. And I was like, oh, well, I'll do another one. And that one exploded. And then I did one more. And then I was like, uh, you know, these are not what I'm passionate about of opening boxes. So I, I got three in, but, uh, but no, people love them and appreciate them. I did it. Mainly I want to do for the unboxing the... and I want to follow it up with like what I paint everything as it's like, you know, here's my regiments. Yeah, yeah. Here are my clusters. Yeah. Because I have, I have like two clusters of clan Fox. I want to fill out the rest of the two men eventually and just Perfect. get like the entire thing out there. And then I can do a great big photo spread of like, here is the entire clan yeah. arrayed order of battle style. Yeah. Well, I think you definitely, people got to get out of just the, uh, here's my box. I'm going to open it. There's got to be something to it. Like for me, it was, uh, I was doing a scale comparison between the new ones and all of the old ones. Uh, and then I actually, you know, I, I stopped both because I was getting less enthusiastic for, that kind of video, but also like I didn't, uh, I didn't, I no longer had old versions of all the new ones uh, that I could use uh, for scale comparison. But, uh, but yeah, I think, uh, cause that was the question. I think when people came out, I was like, what is the scale? Like, how does it compare? And, you know, to it shrunk, so, oh, no, it didn't shrink. It actually expanded slightly. It went from one twenty fifth to like one two sixty seventh or something like that. Yeah, two sixty five, I think. But yeah, it might be two sixty seven. But yeah, a little bit. But at least it's consistent. Like they said, it's cool how they do it. And talking to Anthony. You know, it's basically by volume. Mm. You know, now that everything is 3D, that they can do it basically just kind of do it by by volume and mass. You know, the kind of funny it. thing about the Clan Fox Mechs is compared to that, they are slightly overscaled for their weight. Okay. But they are consistent between each other. Okay. There you go. Some consistency. <sighs> the consistency doesn't really kill me on the tabletop because how how often are you like, you know, playing on the tabletop and all my mechs are right next to each other? Oh, they're like spread out, you know, so... Um, I also, for me, it's more important having unique looking miniatures for the same mech than mm. having the bright scale. Like I'd rather, like if I was going to have a Griffin, you know, I'd rather have an old, you know, an old Ralpartha, you know, a Gashapon, you know, from the old, uh, Dugram series, you know, new Griffin, you or know, the old had... battle droids one that was like a half pound of lead. <laughs> there you go. You can do that too. But yeah, just have like a different, like a mech that actually looks different than the other ones. That's, that's more important to me, even if the scale is a little bit off, but, uh, you know, to a degree, like I, I actually, I love the kids logic, the new ones. Um, mm. you know, um, I mean, they're, you breathe on them and they break, you know, they're extremely fragile, you know, in the reds and, but, uh, the skull quality is wonderful and yeah, just having like, okay, well, you know, I have uh, a rifleman from Kids Logic. I have a rifleman from Ralph Parth. I have a rifleman from Catalyst. You know, they all look a little different. You know, that's cool. I like it. So, but anyway, well, cool. Well, uh, you know, thanks, Chris. This is uh, this has been fun. I'll wrap it up for everybody here. And uh, yeah, this is fun. So definitely check out clanfox.com. 
and uh, see what Chris and his gang have been up to there. You can pick up some cool little Clan Fox swag if you're an Ultra Battletech collector or hop on over to Fortress Miniatures and Games and pick up uh, some Clan Fox uh, stuff as well as pretty much anything else you need from uh, Catalyst Game Labs or from Fossa or from Strato Miniatures, anybody and everybody contributing to Battletech, you know, you can find it over at Fortress uh, Miniatures and Games. So uh, do that. And uh, Chris, thanks a lot. This has been fun. I, I appreciate you sharing your, your time this afternoon with, uh, with me and the rest of these Battletech fans listening. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. My pleasure.